Yeah, thank you for coming and thank you uh, for inviting me here in particular. I would like to thank uh, Christian and Wilfried for organizing and co-organizing the event. Uh, I'm here now for the fourth year in sequence and I'm wondering how engineering and computer science uh, see I have become since then. <laughs> Apparently my topics, at least the methods, fit to the different topics coming up every year. And, and apparently, I, I think we should actually have a collaboration because we are apparently doing the same thing. So. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I'm heading the Network Dynamics Group at the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization in Göttingen. And the work I present today is uh, work together with uh, Martin Roden, Andreas Sorge, and in particular Dirk Witthaut, who is an advanced postdoc in our group. We have also links to the University of Göttingen, um, where I'm a junk professor and we are, for example, teaching and having masters and bachelor students from there. The title is Breath Paradox, Instability and Optimal Design and in Modern Power Grids. And I have uh, no conclusive answers to any of the topics, but I have some ideas I would like to convey today. The topics of our group uh, range from, on different scales, from uh, biological to physical networks. By physical, I mean man-made or physics non-life networks. I, my personal background is mathematical modeling of neurons and neural circuits. And we are also working, for example, on evolutionary dynamics and horizontal gene transfer. Um, today, I would like to talk about this phenomenon. It's called power outage. <laughs> this is a picture of Manhattan um, when there was a major power outage and there are some lights here. Th so this, this light is actually the sun. This is what the future brings, like solar panels. And then there are different lights, like these are lights from cars all. And uh, this is a reflection from the sun. And this one is the only office I found on the office uh, level I found on the picture, which is actually having electric energy and apparently they are having their own local source. So it's uh, partially decentralized and the topic of our talk, of my talk today and actually of our entire working program is how the addition, the growing fraction of renewable energies contributes to stability and operation of power grids on large scales. So in particular we are doing modeling for um, the transmission grid, I think it's called, the large scale, um, in the presence of renewables. And the renewables for us mean basically two things, qualitatively different things. One is known to most of uh, society. It is the fact that those are less reliable and more fluctuating. If you have like wind power, for example, it depends on whether you have wind and you cannot predict wind for longer times. So you can model them as stochastic processes. Um, the second aspect is decentralization. And I, I emphasize that because it's a different aspect of the same problem, but it has also different results. So as I, different consequences, as I try to convince you today. In all of these topics, we are always facing, so oh, we are a theoretical group, so we are trying to condense the essence of a problem and find conditions which guarantee the occurrence of a phenomenon or which exclude some phenomenon. We are facing different kinds of uh, problems when trying to address this. And it has been uh, questions in the last talk, for example, in how far an uh, agent-based model is predictive and it always it's always a question of whether you actually want to predict or whether you want to explore what are possible ways which you can nicely do with simulation models. These systems typically include non-linearities, uh, high dimensionality, so many variables, uh, often have a complicated network connectivity, sometimes there are interaction delays, typically there are strong heterogeneities and uh, stochasticity, as I mentioned, and what people in what some people call network theory, try to do, it try to simplify out some of the problems. For example, you can 
there's a, an approach called uh, generalized modeling. What they do is they um, take into account nonlinearities, but only close to a fixed point. So you have something like a generic linear description with bifurcation structure close to some bifurcation fixed point. Or yeah. And so you, you are simplifying out this, but keep some of the other guys. Often the delays are taken out completely. And this is a sketch of what, you, you, what people do if they don't know or they can't model the full network. They do some mean field or statistical description. So for example, if you average the, the average effect of the other nodes onto one node by the many connections, can be seen as, okay, I assume that every node is roughly the same, so maybe the effect is coming from the entire network and you average out that, then you get an all-to-all -to -all topology and you can also be a bit more progressive, uh, more uh, well, advanced, say, and uh, average on a local scale, what you get is a regular network which has some local regularity, but it has not the full symmetry of the simplest possible network. And we are trying to use uh, bio-inspired approaches and principles of self-organization and developing these theories to understand the full picture, but only for very concrete questions. So we can never say, okay, this is a model for the power grid and this will work like that. But we can say, maybe as I will convince you today, this question, this phenomenon of, of this complex system can be understood if you take into account this and this and this aspect. Uh, for motivation, um, the power grid dynamics um, shall be complemented by smart control, so consumer-based control. Um, but it is even not understood completely how the network itself uh, organizes its dynamics collectively in the absence of such control. There's one nice example from uh, 2006, where a local shutdown led to a non-local impact. Uh, unfortunately, this is in German. I didn't find it in English. Um, there was a, a big uh, ship produced in Meyerwerft, and it was led down to the North Sea and for via a piece of a channel. And they had to cut, uh, like switch off um, power two power lines ac across where the, where the ship crosses uh, for security reasons and um, they tested it and two weeks later the sh actual ship went out and they switched it off again and when they tested it nothing happened or nothing bad happened on a larger scale and when they actually left the ship out then the, there was a large power outage within half an hour it spread over large parts of Europe maybe some of you was also affected uh, November 2006. The message from this slide is just, okay, you have a local change to the system and there's a very non-local impact. Yeah, as I just said, there are just two single high power connections in Northwest Germany cut and there were outages in France, Italy, Austria, uh, some parts of Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Morocco, North Africa. Um, there are delays up to 30 minutes and of course there's lots of power uh, electronics involved and automatic shutoffs and so on. Actually, currently we are investigating whether the shutoff procedure itself caused some of the later uh, power outages in, in, in more distant regions. Um, there are two, well I found two, uh, there are apparently more, my colleague told me there are many more. Um, Sites from uh, officials, so for, for example, E.ON officials declared uh, a great surprise about this problem. In the past, these operations were performed with no problems. And also, as I said, two weeks before, <coughs> the same operation switching off the two lines did not lead to any major power outage. Um, even more interestingly, the head of uh, the French power grid operator uh, Merlin uh, said that we need more interconnections. So it was one of his immediate reactions. Um, of course, we, m we may need more interconnections, 
but it's not so apparent from these power switches, as I hope I can convince you. So our question was, which factors determine the collective dynamics of power grids? Of course, it's a very general question, and we, we, we narrow it down to uh, more specific ones. The setting so far is that the uh, power grid up to about the year 2000 uh, was very largely centralized. It's dominated by large sources, large power plants, and almost this means almost central <coughs> control. It has been said yesterday already explained how what it means. So essentially, the control can be, can be centralized top-down from the power plant side. There's no distributed control necessary. Sorry, in 250, so currently we are having, depending on where you, where you look, I think in Germany it's like around 18 or 19 percent uh, renewable energy uh, production. In 250, it should be at least reversed, so we have at most 18 or 19 percent non-renewables meaning that we have above 80% renewable sources. So the renewable also means more distributed. So we have these different plants, different size, wind park, and here uh, smaller plant. And they are, so the, the control and the production and the um, consumption all are distributed and it's less controllable, at least it's less controllable if you ask whether you can pick one of the nodes and control it from there. Um, so far there are two basic classes of uh, power grid models. One I call engineering based or computational based, where which are very heterogeneous. heterogeneous. They have component level sometimes or coarse-grained component level dynamic. And typically they are small scale, so uh, in other words it's hard to set up a a reasonable large-scale model which you can A, simulate and B, understand anything. Um, and if you look in the physics and mathematics literature, there's another set of models which is uh, more homo homogeneous. It's typically having stati making only statistical statements or quasi-static or flow arguments. So it's about how much energy is transferred from this node to that node. But then you can, because it's so simplified, you can um, simulate or even compute some properties of larger grids. For example, if there's a cascading failure, you have certain uh, likelihood that links fail, what's the likelihood that the, the total power grid still is functional? Um, so there are these two uh, extreme kind of models. This one you can hardly understand, so the, the task is to understand mechanisms in the real system. Here you kick out so many details that you, om, you, you are dealing with a completely different system. Yeah? Of course it may be useful for some questions, but for example the oscillatory dynamics is not described. So the 50 hertz frequency is not into, in this model. Yeah? Um, but frequency control is the control uh, pass we, uh, it's currently used. So we are, we are using an oscillator model which can take into account heterogeneous structure, coarse-grained dynamics of the grid. And well, it's dynamic, it's not static or probabilistic, and it's large-scale. Um, the idea is, comes from uh, synchronous machines. Of course, the real uh, systems does not, uh, the real power grids do not consists of synchronous machines only, but many more, and also has power electronics, which we all skip. But the basic feature is that you have oscillatory dynamics at each node. Huh? So it's the input to each uh, consumer, which is abstracted here as, as, as dots, so it might be a small city or so, um, and the production of each uh, power plant is oscillatory. So it's, it has the 50 hertz oscillation. There are certain parameters which can be derived from the, from the um, physical model of the, of the generators as motors, but you can also see them as abstract parameters telling you something about the capacity of the lines and the, the power input of certain uh, plants or the power consumption of consumers. You can mathematically reduce this model um, to something like this, 
there is a, for each node there is a second order differential equation where this theta now is the mechanical relative phase of oscillator i. So uh, theta i is zero actually if the, if there is no deviation from the phase lock state. So in the if if you assume there is constant um, energy production and con constant consuming. At that stage, you would have a 50 hertz phase lock state, so that all the phases of all consumers and, and, and power plants will be locked and will be a perfect system. And the theta i now describes deviations from this perfect 50 hertz oscillation. The first derivative is uh, describing a damping factor, and the second derivative is describing inertia of, of the system, both on, on both sides, on the consumer and the uh, production side. Can I, well, in the simplest setting, this is this AIJ is just the adjacency matrix telling you where the coupling is. You can also have weighted couplings, which I will not go into today. Um, and PI is one of the other important parameters, which is the power either supplied or consumed by the power plant or the consumer. Um, this model has not been invented by us, but it has been derived from physical principles under certain assumptions. For example, the time scale separation by uh, Filatella et al. It's actually from Denmark. I don't know whether Oliver Gerke knows that thing. Who did that? Trella, we don't know them personally. So it's, uh, I'm not a physicist, so that's it's like actually two physicists and two engineers. Actually, yeah, it's very interesting to, no, to see. The name doesn't pop, pop up okay. This is a grid they simulated. They so this is apparently um, an approximate, uh, an established. I didn't. I have to believe them. It's apparently an established approximation to Zealand grid, which is part of Denmark, where these these uh, parameters are guessed more or less or estimated by the authors to to model to put it into their model. And so it's simple topology and constant parameters and they have simulated the impact of temporary per perturbation. So what happens if you just, for example, um, reduce the consumption of uh, this guy by 20% then it will work like this. If you put noise here, what happens? Yeah? So this is what is in the paper. And we try to, we try to generalize that to more complex uh, networks and ask also some more non-dynamics uh, motivated questions. The first thing we do is a bifurcation analysis of the simplest si system to understand how what the key mechanisms are and whether it can uh, can fit at all with the oscillatory dynamics of the real grid. So you take the take one power plant and one consumer, and obviously if you have this simple grid, then the power produced here must equal the power consumed here, and there's only one line, and this is just for fun. And uh, you compute the difference equation, and you then you uh, do a bifurcation analysis on this equation. It's a two-dimensional uh, state space with two parameters, k and p0. This is the capacity of the line. This is the power produced. And uh, this is the result in pictures. Well, you can derive like two pages of formulas, but what comes out is uh, essentially this one. If some, some results are trivial, yeah, if the load is larger than the capacity, which is the black area, you have a blackout. Yeah, this is trivial. Huh? So essentially it means that you pump more energy into the system than the line can transport. And then you can also go into the regime where, where the coupling is very large, so the, the load is very low, for example here. There you have a globally stable fixed point, so you have a synchronous attractor where the system is actually a, in a phase locked state. And uh, the, more, the most interesting regime is up here, where both of these states coexist. So here you have um, a limit cycle attractor, so in a non-stable, uh, no, no, how can you see? So you have um, a state where this, the, the, the frequency is not fixed, but it oscillates. So the, there's oscillation among the fixed point, which describes the, the 50 hertz. So there's something like power outage. And at the same set of parameters, at the same capacity and uh, production, uh, energy production, you have uh, 
a stable fixed point, but it's not globally stable anymore. So you have coexistence of the normal operation and the power outage regime, which tells you already that in, in this simple system it is present, and it also means that any system which contains that simple system with these parameters in a more complex network will also exhibit coexistence. So you don't have to check because you can just prove it, yeah? I, the model assumption, again, you cannot prove, of course. You can check, make consistency check, but given the, the model assumption for the simple two-node system, if you find coexistence, this means that you find coexistence of a power outage state and a normal operation state in, the, in any network, essentially, because, well, any network which contains that simple two-node grid. And this is actually what has been found. I mean, this is the example of the ship crossing. If you once sh shut it off and there's normal operation, you shut it off the next time and there's power outage, you still have the same system. There's no line built in between these two weeks, no additional line. Um, you have a different state of the system and you can run into power outage. <coughs> now we did a systematic computational study for different classes of uh, network connectivity. And just to show that these all actually does not, the main phenomenon does not depend on the class. These are just sketches. It just, it's not the real topology. It just says, okay, this one is a grid light, uh, like checkerboard like structure where you put in power, pl power plants and, and consumers. This is a random network and this is uh, what's known as a small world network. So it has some feature of this one and some feature of that, some part of that. And in all, for all <laughs> cases, what we measured is the degree of synchrony um, as a function of the ratio of line capacity over um, energy produced, total energy produced, or every, yeah, average energy, if you want, per uh, node. And so what is plotted here is the order parameter for those who know uh, synchronization theory. The order parameter is just the measure of how synchronous the system is. If it's one, this means that all phases are identical. If it's zero, this means that the phases are essentially randomly changing or not coordinated at all. So, so this means the green line, for example, is for the completely centralized network where there's no dis decentralization, so only a few nuclear and coal plants, say. And you see that the the threshold to synchronization is here, and uh, it's moving with increasing degree of uh, decentralization. So, but note that now we, we don't have to take into account the fluctuations, it's only a matter, the question of decentralization itself, so it's a structural feature. You um, increase the line capacity or decrease the, the power consumed and you move the threshold of synchronization to larger values, meaning that at the same value, it is better to have more distributed sources or more decentralized sources than uh, more centralized ones. The second plot gives you um, an idea of the more, the less known but more important quantity, which is V infinity, we call it, which is, this is not the order parameter for the synchronization, but it's the order parameter of the ch rate of change of phases so it's actually not important whether this is one or not, it's just important that it's not zero because it's, it's not important that you, have, you are in an identical synchronous state, but it's only important that you have a phase lock state. But in a phase lock state, all the phase differences are the same. And this guy measures the phase differences, if the variation of phase differences. If it's zero, then you are completely safe. So, and here you see the deviation from zero and you see also that with increasing decentralization, the um, power grid becomes more uh, more easily uh, phase locked. Yeah? So this was for the quasi regular network. So the regular network with plants and consumers put on top of it. You can do the same for random networks. You can do the same for small world networks, and you always find the same trend. Decentralizing helps. So more and smaller sources help to increase the stationary stability. Stationary here means you have a fixed consumer and a fixed producer level. Uh, apparently I just 
half an hour ago, I checked some of the emails and my co-author uh, sent me an email saying, we have two referees, both are positive, they want some changes in the figure caption. So it's uh, almost accept accepted now. <coughs> um, now I go for a second topic. It is uh, called Bress Paradox. If there's an apostrophe missing, Bress was a German, actually, um, traffic scientist in the economy department, I think. And he found that if you have a street network and you close down a street because of some construction, the traffic may actually flow better than before. The total, total number of congestions goes down. And there are also systems, so it was, was just a pure observation and he did a model on that showing that there's some flow, uh, in certain flow networks it actually happens. So if you just measure the number of cars flowing across streets or the number of particles flowing across lines, then you can have breast paradox. Um, it was later then discovered in many other systems. In particular, it was um, confirmed in traffic grids, for example, in Manhattan. They actually, on purpose, <coughs> closed some part, part of the street. Uh, well, not quite on purpose, but they, they interacted with the, with the city council to, to measure traffic when they closed down 42nd Street. Who knows 42nd Street in Manhattan? It's a very busy street. It's one of the key streets which are not the avenues. It's one of the uh, ver how do you say? horizontal streets, like yeah. east-west. Yeah. And they closed down part of it, and they said, well, we can't do it. And the result was it was actually better. So they, what they did, like more than a decade later, is they, they opened it, but they, it's not as broad as it was before. So And it's still flowing. I don't know how it's today, but it was really a confirmation of that without previous data. Um, so we found now this uh, phenomenon which was established in different systems with flows for oscillator networks and in particular for these grid models. Um, and to understand how it works, you make um, energy production level or consumption level and a very simple grid. And this one is actually in a regime, so the parameters and so on are fixed. It doesn't matter how they exactly are but they are close to the limit, so they are in this coexistence regime. And now there's a phase locking, so it's everything is working fine. Now you build new lines. This is what the fr French uh, grid operator boss told us. We add a new capacity here, or we add a new line. Well, in both cases, the system goes asynchronous. Actually, the typically the um, what's these consumers deviate from the producers. So they, they're they still roughly locked, as you can see. So the green lines here, for example, are doing almost the same thing, but they're not locked with respect to the average and also not to the other guys. So this means that um, adding capacity or adding new lines may not necessarily help. In general, it may help, but it also may not help. How does it work? Um, you don't have to read the phases here, which is just tell you, tell you the phase locking ratios. But in the original network, there are certain loads. And th there's, there's power flowing from here to there, and so on, or energy flowing. And now what, what you do is you add this line, for example. And then you increase. What, what happens is that there's more flow from here to there, huh? because there's you are, yeah, well, you have induced a flow from here to there, which means that the total flow towards this node is increased. But now these lines have not been updated, so there's now more, uh, ener more energy flowing across that line, so this is beyond the line capacity, and this one then breaks down. That's why there's uh, desynchronization. In general, you can also think of it as uh, geometric frustration. So you have a, can I have a flip chart? Oops. Mm. 
you have some, um, you have a complicated network and now you have some um, cycle and at each cycle you have to have a fixed phase otherwise well there's no if the phase is not fixed then you don't have a stable frequency and you have power outage yeah? or you can get power outage now the difference between the difference between these two nodes delta phi 1 2 and the difference between these two nodes and so on yeah Along each each circle, yeah, you have some some cycle, and if if you sum over all these differences, they have to be zero, yeah, because this means that the the phase is well defined. So there are conditions which, in addition to the stability conditions of the actual system, there are conditions which come from a geometric effect of having cycles in the network. And of course, if you have a real grid. You have many of these cycles. Now, if you change, if you put another link, for example, here, you create more cycles. For example, this one and this one. In addition to the other one, this one wasn't still here. Yeah? You have two more conditions, and they are not always satisfied. So it's a matter of, of geometric <coughs> frustration if they cannot be satisfied. And actually, these are not the only two circles which are added, but if you have a more complicated network, for example, you have nodes here. You would also have, I don't know, this additional cycle and this one. Yeah, many. And you have to check them all. If they don't all work, you have rest paradox and power outage due to, or can have power outage due to um, geometric frustration. Oh, you know, you don't see the sprite. So this is, again, the Synchronization order parameter, this time because it's very small and, and simple system, it's pretty smooth. So for the original system, it, it is made such that it increases at one. The original network is having its synchronization transition here. Now you add a line, meaning you need more capacity for the same uh, en energy transfer with in these other two systems, one well, with the added line and with the upgraded line. You can also compute it, and the stability phase diagram looks like this, showing that the um, if you increase the, capac the capacity of uh, this line, actually, what happens is that you um, need more capacity until you can synchronize it. Yeah, so this is the synchronization threshold. This is this point plotted as a function of the extra capacity you install. So you see that it gets worse and worse, but not so much, but a bit, yeah? So if, you, but the point is you're actually operating, the real grid is also operating close, as close as possible to the capacity limit because otherwise you have waste capacity. If you have more installed than you need. Yeah, so this is what I just said. The cyclic phase differences need to add up to zero or multiples of 360 degrees and Additional capacity, therefore, may break the balance. So this cannot be satisfied. And uh, you may wonder whether it's, it's restricted to the simple network. No, it's not. And you can simulate it in different systems on different topologies. And one interesting one is uh, the power grid of Britain, the British island um, transmission grid. It's uh, available online. And, uh, well, there's one. If you add this one, which might actually, it's a, naively you could think that this, adding this line may help because it somehow connects this branch and, and this part. Uh, but this is actually prone to breast paradox. So our model predicts if you have, if the model would be right, if the model would be completely faithful, then you would predict that if you build this line, you have breast paradox. So it means for the real grid operator, be careful before you build the line. Um, so again, you can ask how important this breast paradox is. Um, and we studied it across different networks, and this is just uh, the example for the average. This is what I mentioned in the beginning motivation slide. 
many people average out and they look at these quantities and you see that the number of edge, if you remove edges from a given grid, how does the synchronization threshold change and it always decreases, meaning that it is as you would naively expect. You take out links, so then it gets worse. Or in other way, you put, out, put in more links and then the synchronization threshold gets uh, better, so it's easier to synchronize. And, but for, for many, actually all, almost all single realizations, if you have one grid and you do it once, you take out this link and then you take out that link, take out another link, then most of the time it still drops, but sometimes it increases here, 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 and this is the magnification of, of this part. It shows an increase of, uh, well, decrease of the synchronization threshold of uh, three, increase of 3%, of 15%, and so on, so it gets worse by 15% if you take out one specific link which is here the 50th one, so it's by chance, yeah, it's randomly drawn links. It's just saying that uh, most of the instances are as you expect, but typically there are some instances where it's different than you expect. So there is this paradox that you add links and some of the links will cause a problem. And we found that across networks and across different topologies and so on, it's always of the order of one to 10%. How, how many, what's a fraction of links you, you may, may want to add locally, but you shouldn't add because of that paradox. Uh, yes, and I would like to conclude already. Uh, summarize the results. We demonstrated that some key capabilities of an intermediate scale oscillator network, so it has the feature that's actually oscillatory, so it describes the network topology and it describes the oscillatory dynamics in contrast to the static picture, but it still allows to find out some mechanisms underlying the collective dynamics of the entire system as opposed to more detailed models. Uh, if you distribute the, so distribute the sources more, there's larger stationary stability. We have also meanwhile confirmed that what everyone expects, if you put, um, put uh, renewable sources, you will have more uh, fluctuations and the fluctuations counteract this. So, so fluctuations make it worse to, to have a stable operation, but the decentralization itself help. So there are counteracting effects. We cannot predict um, how quantitatively how large these effects are because we have a very simple model, but we can say that these are counteracting effects. And we have found uh, a breast paradox, so adding lines or increasing line capacity may be bad. Is yeah. possible? Can yeah. you have a comment or raise Yeah, it? yeah, go ahead. Ah, you turn back, please. Ah, the thing, okay, this is a stationary stability, which yeah. might, might be true in the dynamics. Exactly. Uh, and a uh, breast paradox. If you, if you, I will say from a stable situation, Does it have the opposite effect or necessary or not necessary? Is is the case symmetrical basically or not? Did, so you, did you try this as well? So yeah, this is essentially yeah, this is this, this picture. Yeah? This is what you actually do. So forget about this average for a moment. Yeah, I so you take one grid, yeah. and now you take to pick a random edge in that grid and take it out, yeah. and you ask whether the synchronization threshold is worse or better, yeah. and this is plotted one over the. KC, the, the critical <coughs> situation. So it's typically it drops, meaning that it with less links it becomes worse, but sometimes it increases, meaning that with le less links it actually becomes better. So cutting a link may also help. Yeah. This are these okay. cases. This is yeah. One is positive. So this this is percentage of line capacity, or it's always relative to the to the load. Yeah, you can also say you keep the line capacity, you cut the line. And you can then increase the power, the energy produced by 15%. This is what it says. No, it's not true. No, no, sorry. I take it back. This is the 15% is on the scale of uh, of the how much the critical capacity. So for small, it's true. So if you take 3%, it's it's one over 1.03. So it's about 3% increase. Yeah. 
So you can increase the power load by 3% if you cut a line. This is what it means. For 15, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an inverse relation, so it's not trivial, but it's simple to compute. Oops. Okay, um, one more thing. There are the many things are not in the model, obviously, but some things can be taken into account. I've just mentioned that instantaneous perturbations, which I didn't show today because of uh, time limitation, we are currently investigating. It's also partly in the paper, which will hopefully be published soon. Um, again, there are counteracting effects. You make a dynamic perturbation to the stationary state. So, for example, you increase the load, uh, the power produced at some plant by a certain amount for a certain time. Like there's a 10 minutes wind input, or there's a consumer switching on or off even. And uh, we found that with increasing decentralization, um, the power grid is less robust. So essentially confirming what we expect anyway. At the same time, there are the structure, the decentralization helps, which uh, lines are most critical is a question I will address in my final slide, which is the next one. Apparently, these are not those with the highest load. And uh, we don't know the details of it, but we have an example. Um, then it's important to have the to investigate the sensitivity to continuous fluctuations. We are currently doing it in a very, very simple model, and it's actually very hard to understand even for two nodes. And so every power grid operator who tells me they can reliably predict the influence of, of uh, fluctuations in their real grid, I don't believe them. <coughs> for example, there are certain access points in state space. So if you do this, then it will exit here. If you do that, it will exit in another way. So there were different kinds of power outage, actually, even in a simple model with two nodes. Yeah? And um, then there's a question of redistribution of energy. Uh, of course, in, in Germany, for example, there's a question of how you to get lots of the wind energy produced in the north of the country to the south, where it's most uh, consumed. And uh, we got some geographically and time resource data from uh, Siemens Research Munich, um, which we are currently analyzing the problem there is it's very, very coarse uh, only. So we can put real data into the model. Um, so how, the final question I would like, like to give you as a, as a homework problem, so we don't know the solution, but we have, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually, we, we don't know the solution since uh, more than a year from now. Uh, the la so we started last, March or something, and uh, this picture is from, I think, last year, October, and it's not, no, it's actually from last year, December, okay, it's not clear what it is. Huh? What's shown here is the average load of the link, and red means high load, and blue means uh, low node, uh, load, and so these ones are the most, for example, this one is the most loaded link in the entire British grid in our model. Yeah? Now you can ask, what is the probability of failure of the entire uh, system when you cut one of the links? You keep the rest, and then you could think, yeah, okay, well if you cut this, but it's very loaded, then it will be boosting the system, but no, it's not really true. Yeah, this is actually one of the most stable links in the entire grid. So um, some of the links have the correlation, so it's have a correlation that you have a high power load and a high failure probability, for example, this one. And uh, our current working hypothesis is that it has something to do with uh, redundancy, not so much with load. So it's a question of how redundant it is. And we are, but it's not trivial. We cannot just run graph theoretical measures of redundancy, like K connectivity on the graph. It doesn't work. So there's more something more involved which interacts with, 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 Sorry, inter you get these yeah, you, you take this, so you have a, mo it's a model system, yeah? You take the model system, this is 
the actual, this is the stationary state of the model system. This is very simple, it's one shot. And here you take, hmm? and here you take out uh, the link and you can, the actually it's averaged over different distributions of where you put the plants because we, are, we have not the fixed position of the plants. And it's also averaged over states, different states of the map. Hmm? The different phase lock states, the different operation regimes if you wish. And then you do many of these simulations and then you count the number of, of cases where taking out that link will lead to power outage. And this 60%, if you do it here, it's only 10% of the guys. Yeah. Of course, it's an estimate. It's not, it's not this so mathematically speaking, it's not the probability, it's a histogram plotted here. But it's always like that with real simulations. Okay, with it, I would like to finish. I just mentioned that we are working on different fields of, of network dynamics, basically trying to find out theoretical basics of uh, network dynamics. This uh, power grid issue is something about control and also about design and stability, so it bridges some of these two fields. And uh, with that, I stop the other work on autonomous systems, that's why I'm here every year in, in Klagenfurt, uh, like uh, two years ago I told something about computation which is now actually published since uh, last week. Um, and I would like to thank the members of uh, my group, in particular Martin Roden, who is the first author of the study on stability and Dirk Witthout, who was uh, finding the phenomenon of Westphal doctrine oscillator networks first. Andreas Sorge is also co-authoring one of the, of the works. He spent part of his PhD time on working on this bifurcation uh, scenario. And well, all my other collaborators, and of course you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.